morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome. Good to see everybody. Um, this is the third webinar and the final webinar in the Learning to Advocate for Children and Family series. I'm excited to have you here and um, looking forward to a great session today. Uh, I am Michael Accardi. I work at the Brazelton Touchpoint Center. And I just wanted to run through a couple of quick things. Um, one is today we have live Spanish translation um, with our colleague Maria Jose. Um, you can join uh, by clicking the interpretation link in your webinar controls. Um, and if I may just ask that folks remember to mute themselves because we can hear your conversations in the background, um, which is wonderful. But um, we want to make sure that everyone can participate fully today. So thank you so much. Um, and as I said, you can, in, in the webinar controls at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you click interpretation, and then you can um, join the Spanish channel that way. Um, we also offer closed captioning and live transcript, which you can also access um, in your Zoom controls. You simply click live transcript and then click show subtitle click subtitle settings, and you can view the full transcript that way. Uh, please feel free to leave a comment, a chat um, in the chat box, um, which is at the bottom um, of your Zoom controls. We welcome all comments. If you have a technical issue, you can share it there, or you can email us at, um, you can email our colleague Nelson, who's the producer of today's webinar at nelson.artavia at children's.harvard.edu. <laughs> um, and just again, a reminder too, as you come into the room, um, please put yourself on mute and please feel free to identify yourself in the chat, who you are, where you're joining from. Um, and um, you can join by camera if you can, that would be wonderful. Sometimes people are participating from different places, their office, their homes, their cars. So I understand if you can't join by camera, but please feel free to join us. Um, all are welcome. Um, there will be a feedback survey and a certificate of attendance that you can download once you complete the survey. Um, you'll get the survey either at the end of the webinar or you can, you can find it in the email that comes following the webinar. Um, and um, you will download your certificate of attendance after you join the, after you complete the survey rather. Uh, we also have done a digital badge for social media, which um, we're really excited about being able to offer. Um, you can download that and then you can use it, you know, as your Sorry, image on social media. Um, and um, tell everybody in the world that you are an advocate for children and families. I have mine up on LinkedIn and I love seeing it every time I go on there. And we also, for this series, created a resource, um, which is an advocacy reference guide. So something we hope everybody can use that um, you can have as a desktop reference. It's got helpful tips um, and pointers on doing your advocacy by phone, by email, or in person with your elected officials. And that is also available when my, you uh, survey. My one credit card is 500 and right. if I may just ask one more time as a reminder, when you come in, please make sure you put yourself on mute because we can hear the conversations you're having in the background. And uh, we want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to fully participate today. So thank you so much for muting yourselves. Today, our facilitator is uh, Katriana McDonald. Uh, she's founder and president of Lynchpin Strategies, a colleague and a friend and a lifelong advocate for children and families, spending her career in this field. So excited to have her with us once again. And uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to her. Michael, thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of you who are having conversations for muting or I'm going to stop for a moment. While are 
Thank you, everybody. It's really exciting to be here and to continue the conversation that we began um, about six weeks ago now, around advocating for your yeah, yeah. families. Um, when we last spoke in our last webinar, we talked about how to make a plan with partners for your meeting or your conversation with elected officials about the issue that you want to work on. And we talked about working with those partners, dividing up the talking points, who is going to do the introduction to the issue, who is going to tell one or more stories that will help to engage the listener and connect the listener to the issue that you're talking about and that you care about. And then once you've kind of made that emotional connection with your story, who is going to share the facts to illustrate the need for the solution or the impact of the problem? And then who's going to be the person who brings it home and makes the really clear ask, telling your elected official or the staff who work for them, here is what we need you to do. Well, that's great, but it kind of begs a question, doesn't it? How do you find other people in your community to join you? How do you identify the folks that can be powerful advocates with you? And what are the best tools and techniques to help spread your message? That's what we're going to be talking about today. So if we could go to the next slide, um, as I have said on prior webinars, the number one question that I was asked when I was a congressional staff person was, does advocacy matter? Does all of the work that we put into getting ready for a meeting, requesting a meeting, sometimes coming to Washington, writing our, our emails, making our phone calls, does it matter? Does anybody pay attention and does it make a difference? And as you know, if you have joined one of our prior webinars, my answer to that is absolutely yes. So in one of my first jobs on Capitol Hill, I had a really clear and overwhelming illustration of that when I walked through the door for my new job. And if we could go to the next slide. So um, in the fall, November of 1994, Newt Gingrich, who was a congressman from Georgia, um, led the Republican Party in the House of Representatives to win the majority. And it was clear that uh, Gingrich was going to become speaker. And in November and December of 1994, he traveled around the country giving speeches and talking about what he would do as Speaker of the House of Representatives. And he had a list of things that he planned, but one of them, he said that he did not believe that public television deserved federal funding. And he made a very clear promise over and over and over again in his speeches, as Speaker of the House of Representatives, he would never allow a piece of legislation to come to a vote on the floor of the House of Representatives that had money in it for public television. Well, my dad, who only watches public television, was really upset. And he called me up because he had a daughter who worked in Washington, DC. And he wanted the address of every member of the congressional delegation from California. And he was gonna write them each a letter talking about why public television is important and why it ought to be funded. And you know, for dad, this was a really big deal. He was about 50 years old, and um, my family are immigrants to this country. And although we came to the U.S. from a country where people generally think highly of the government, um, they came from a social and economic class where 
you don't really want the government to be paying attention to you. If you are interacting with your government, it probably means that you are in trouble. My 50-year-old dad had lived in the U.S. for about 30 years at that point, and he had never contacted a member of Congress. But he sat down and he wrote letters to every member of the congressional delegation, wrote them by hand, not even by computer, and sent them off saying why he thought public broadcasting money was so important. Well, I started a new job in February of 1995. And part of my portfolio included funding for public broadcasting. And I remember the first day I walked into my office and there was a desk and there was a very tall filing cabinet. And next to the filing cabinet was a stack of papers that was taller than I am. So I'm five foot four, which is not that tall for an adult, but that is really tall for a stack of papers. And it turned out that that stack of papers was all of the letters that this member of Congress had received from people across the country asking for funding for public broadcasting. And you might not be surprised to hear that when Speaker Gingrich brought his first funding bill to the floor of the House of Representatives, it actually did have money in it for public broadcasting. And a year later, when he brought his second funding bill to the floor of the House of Representatives for a vote, it had an increase in funding for public broadcasting. Because when people work together and speak out, it changes policy and it changes decisions. So on the next slide, we have one of my favorite graphics ever. Organizing um, your colleagues, people who care about the same things that you do, you may feel like a very little fish in a big pond with lots of sharks uh, that are swimming around. But when people speak in numbers as they did spontaneously in uh, the case of public broadcasting, then you have the opportunity to be the big fish instead of the little one who is getting gobbled up. Now, I know that on this webinar, there are a lot of folks who are new to advocacy, but also some folks who have been doing this in your community for a while. So on the next slide, we're really interested to hear from you in the chat. When you've identified an issue that you care about and you want to build the numbers of people who are reaching out, you want to find partners to work with, how do you find, how do you build those numbers? How do you find those partners? And I am going to pause for a minute and give folks a chance to put their answers in the chat. How do you find like-minded folks who care about the issues you care about? Maybe it's health insurance, Maybe it's housing, maybe it's childcare, maybe it's a child tax credit. So um, Cyan, I think I got that right. Social media, absolutely. Community outreach, door knocking, flyers, community events. Uh, a couple of folks who attend community events, networking, identifying coalitions that are already established and jump into the conversation about your issue. Um, I love it. Church, social media, friends and family, community partners. Absolutely. Um, I get a lot of information about word of mouth talking to the network of friends and families and colleagues. You guys have all of this down. List serves, outreach, um, church and other religious opportunities. Great. And 
So you've gotten already most of the spots that I have on the next slide. So houses of worship are a great way to find people who care about the same thing that you do. Online affinity groups, local chapters of national organizations are another really good way to both get information and also find people who want to work on the same thing that you do. Sometimes school-based groups like the Parent Teacher Association can help to organize and coalesce folks. In my community, the library um, is a great resource where librarians connect people who care about things. And we've got community bulletin boards, both at our library and also at the grocery store. And it's interesting how many people post information flyers about um, community-based issues, really local issues, um, and looking for people who want to work on things. In my community, we also have a free local newspaper, and that is another great way to be connected to people who care about issues. Um, and uh, employee unions can also be another source of information. Um, and as you said, word of mouth, absolutely. So numbers are important and helpful, and we definitely want to build the number of people who are um, working on an issue. But there is another way, um, in addition to numbers, that you can help um, build your power base. And that is by developing unexpected allies. So if you could take us to the next slide. Um, unexpected allies can be real power boosters where you've got one person from a particular perspective with a particular message who is telling the story from their perspective and another person or organization that cares about the same thing, but is coming to it from a different perspective with different information. And sometimes because of background or perspective, um, if a message isn't resonating from one partner, it might resonate from another partner. And you can create a situation where together um, your influence is more than just the sum of the parts. So on the next slide, we're gonna revisit for a moment a story that um, I told last time. Um, and I described it as the $50 million story about a young man who uh, went to Job Corps for job training. And when he came to speak to Congress about why Job Corps was important, he told a story about his life and as a 13 year old taking his life savings and spending it um, buying Paul Bearer gloves. And the reason that he had done that was because at the age of 13, he had been a pallbearer in funerals for so many of his friends. And when they went to the funeral home for the funeral, the funeral home only had white cotton adult size gloves. And this young man was so afraid he was going to slip and drop his friends that he took his money and he bought a pair of pallbearer pall gloves that fit. That was a hugely gripping story, which I heard more than 25 years later and uh, 25 years ago. And uh, after more than two decades, it still makes a huge impression on me. And I still remember it so very clearly. Um, what I mentioned last time, but didn't go into a lot of detail around is that that young man was a partner in testifying in front of the Congressional Funding Committee with the Vice President of Human Relations for Jiffy Lube, um, which is, or sorry, excuse me, for Rotorooter, which was the company that employed this young man after he graduated from Job Corps. And um, when we set up this testimony, um, the vice president of human relations who came, you know, in his suit, 
he had a master's degree in business administration. He had a background that was actually much more similar to most of the members of Congress who were listening to the testimony. Um, and he talked about the need for Job Corps training, Job Corps programs from a business point of view. He talked about how difficult it was to find reliable employees, people who would show up every day on time, people who would treat the customers well, people who had the basic job skills. And he talked about what a value it was to his company to be able to partner with Job Corps and design the training that young men and women would go through um, so that they could be ready to walk onto the job on day one when they graduated. Now, I personally thought that the employer, the VP of HR, he did a good job, but his comments, his perspective resonated much less clearly with me than the story about the young man. However, there are potentially folks in the audience who heard the story about the young man and what they focused on were other details. Um, the fact that he grew up in a community with gangs, um, the fact that he became a father as a teenager, the fact that he dropped out of high school and they may have focused on those details and may not have been as moved by the story about the gloves as I was. So having that one-two punch with speakers from different perspectives and slightly different, although complementary messages can help you carry your message to the listener, even when the listener may not be moved by the details that move you. So if you are looking in your community for unexpected allies, who might you find? On the next slide, um, we've got some uh, pictures captured from the Council for Strong America, which is an organization that advocates for young children and they make unexpected allies their bread and butter. So for example, um, the picture on the far left of a gentleman in a police uniform is from Fight Crime Invest in Kids. And that is the CSA group that works with law enforcement to advocate for funding that for children so that there are alternatives for kids and we are supporting healthy growth and development as opposed to life trajectories that can get kids involved in the juvenile justice system. Mission readiness is the next uh, strand of their work. And the picture here, obviously, um, I think that's a general. It's been a little while since I studied up on um, my epaulettes and uh, the military insignia. Um, but their message is talking about the needs of the military for young men and women who have the education and the fitness needed to go into the military. And they advocate for early childhood programs so that we can be um, raising the next generation of people for the armed services. Ready Nation is represented by the businessman in the middle. Um, Champions for America's Future is a group of athletes who advocate for uh, young children and programs that benefit kids and families. And last, um, Shepherding the Next Generation is the uh, group within CSA of ministers, rabbis, and other faith leaders who work to support young kids. If you could go to the next slide for me, um, who else might be an unexpected ally? In other cases, we've got actors, musicians, journalists, um, social media influencers. And I want to make sure to say that your unexpected ally doesn't have to be famous. You know, it can be great if you do have a 
celebrity in your community who is willing to come to the aid of your cause. But you can find folks who fall into these various categories and they don't need to be famous. So for example, um, again, looking at the community that I live in, we had a terrible issue as did many other places during the pandemic with teen suicide. And in our community, um, there was a teenager who had been on the football team who died by suicide. The football coach was known and beloved in the community, knows everyone in the community because he has taught at the local high school for a very long time. Um, and he became a spokesperson and an unexpected ally with some of the mental health groups that were advocating for additional resources and supports for mental health. So he wasn't the advocate, he wasn't the athlete, he was the coach, um, but he became an unexpected ally to the mental health advocates. So you can look in your community for the business leader doesn't need to be the president of a Fortune 500 company, but could be the owner or leader of a company that's well known in your community. Um, doesn't need to be a, you know, the Catholic count, uh, Conference of Bishops, but could be a well known and respected faith leader in your own community. There is a new, relatively new, group of unexpected allies that have been developing their power in perhaps unexpected ways in the last 10 or so years, and that is young people. And I want to pause here for a moment because this is a webinar about advocating for children and families. And for a long time, people have largely assumed that children don't, they don't know enough about these issues to weigh in, or we should protect children from adult conversations and let them be children for as long as we can. And we've not really used children as advocates on issues that they care about. And there's been kind of a icky feeling, like if adults are joining with young people to advocate, there's kind of a feeling like maybe those young people are being used. Well, that really started to change with the Parkland young people, who were the first group sort of in substantial numbers who took matters into their own hands as survivors of that terrible shooting, and upended all of the assumptions about what youth could or should do by way of advocacy. So on the left, this is a picture of Emma Gonzalez, who was one of the Parkland survivors who organized her uh, survivor classmates to advocate around gun control. And how sad that she is now um, mentoring Maya Cerillo, whose picture is in the middle, who survived the Uvalde shooting. Another young person who has gotten a lot of attention about her uh, for her advocacy is Greta Thunberg, who um, I think is well known as a climate change advocate. But we don't often think of young people as potential influencers and potential advocates. Um, but certainly these three young people are showing that they can do, uh, that they can be a part of advocacy in a really substantial and influential way. So I'm interested to see in the chat, when you think about who are the influencers in your community that you might be able to join with? as an expected ally or as an unexpected ally, who are they? So um, we'll go to the next slide while you have a minute to think about it. And then I'd love to see in the chat, who are the influencers that 
to, can help you get your message out and can make a difference. We'll pause to give you a moment to put your thoughts in the chat. Maggie says that the Chamber of Commerce and business leaders absolutely can be influential. Local churches, school boards, local businesses, representatives, parents, the Homeless Alliance, local congressmen, colleagues, the families. What a great point. You know, the families, again, um, are so often left out especially if they come from socially and economically disadvantaged backgrounds or parts of town, we assume that they might not have the education they need. They might not be sophisticated enough to join us as partners in advocacy. Um, but in fact, as we discussed on the last webinar about telling your story, um, especially when parents are coached a little bit to help them um, identify the details that can make them really compelling advocates. Parents can be incredible advocates and partners. Um, let's see, city council members, local co-op extensions, um, church and high school students, um, and I, I love that idea. Um, I know that sometimes an advocacy group, especially if they're advocating on something that has a really direct impact on the school or on high school students, sometimes advocacy organizations partner with a teacher and a high school class to develop a civics or government initiative um, you know, for a, a government class or a civics class. And um, students put what they're learning in the classroom to work through advocacy for something that they care about. Um, the Children's Trust can be a great partner and influencer in your community. Um, families who have completed, completed the programs that you are advocating for and children who attended the program who've now grown up and are parents themselves. Um, local elected officials, local indigenous elders, absolutely. They know everyone and they're respected in the community. Um, Summer says, I live in a big college football town and coaches or players get a lot of attention. People respect them when they talk. Um, it makes news, absolutely. You know, and I think Summer's point is a great, uh, raises a really great point that the people who are influencers are going to be different community to community. A big college football town means that the coach and the players may have more influence than somebody who lives somewhere else where it's not quite as big a deal. Um, Aldermen, different families, small businesses, graduates and children of parents who have taken a child abuse prevention course, great. Interesting, not just businesses, but um, Wilmarie says local banks and credit unions are influential, interesting. Um, so a wide variety and it's so great to see so many um, suggestions and recommendations here for the people who can help to be influencers. Um, so once you have identified your influencers, you have um, hopefully identified folks who can be unexpected uh, partners and allies. Another thing to do if you are fortunate enough to have an array of partners and options for bringing people to a particular meeting with a particular decision maker, um, how do you decide which influencers, which partners should kind of take the lead in your conversations? 
our last slide last uh, webinar, and which was the first slide today, said make a plan with your partner and partners and decide who is going to take which set of talking points. Um, as you have identified your influencers, and the influencers might be different depending on the community that you're in, your list of influencers might change slightly depending on who your audience is. So if you are going to talk to a member of the city council who has a key vote on a particular issue you care about, you want to do a little bit of research in advance. What does that uh, city council woman, let's say, what is her voting track record? What is her background? Who are the people that she's likely to listen to? Is she a member of her local church or synagogue? If so, then a faith leader from that um, from that congregation might be a particularly important influencer. Did she serve as a member of the Chamber of Commerce? If so, she's probably not a member of the Chamber of Commerce anymore as a uh, city councilwoman, but the current president of the Chamber of Commerce might be a very significant and influential influencer. Did the uh, city councilwoman grow up in the area? Is there a teacher that she particularly liked and enjoyed? Maybe someone who's retired now, but still active in the community, or maybe someone who's still teaching. You can do sort of a power map of what are the connections in the community that that decision maker has. And while all of your partners might attend the in-person or Zoom meeting with your audience, with the, the decision maker that you're trying to influence, you might change up who does the talking, which examples are used based on the connections that that elected official has. So let's switch gears for a minute and talk about getting the word out, which is on the next slide. So again, this is something that I think you have a lot of expertise in, and I'm interested in hearing from you. Obviously, we all attempt to work the traditional media. It is wonderful if you can get a reporter, um, whether it's a television news reporter or a print reporter, um, maybe a radio reporter. It's great if you can have somebody from the traditional media come and do a story on a family you serve, on an issue you care about, on a problem that needs to be fixed and help you draw attention. Not only can it help you draw attention and get the message out about the problem and the solution, it can help you attract additional partners and advocates. Social media has for many people, particularly younger folks, replaced traditional media as the source of information. I can't remember the last time my 17 year old daughter turned on a television. She gets all her news off Instagram, TikTok, um, and I don't even know all of the places, which I have to say I find a little frightening, um, but uh, she is very typical of the kids her age. Um, Instagram, TikTok, videos, posted to YouTube are also another way of getting the word out. Um, in the chat, folks talked about community events, um, attending those events, maybe having a booth, maybe handing out flyers. Um, Rotary and Lions Club and other social groups are another great way to get information out. Um, I am not a Rotary member myself, but I actually was contacted not that long ago by someone who is a Rotary member and whose job it is to line up speakers. And she had heard that there's an issue I'm working on and she invited me to come and talk with your group. 
Are there other ways that you use to get the word out? Not necessarily to recruit partners, which we talked about earlier in this session, but if you are trying to get information out about your issue, how do you do that? Church bulletins, a great way to communicate. Postcards, much less expensive than mailers, um, easier to manage, cheaper to print, cheaper to mail, uh, but a great way to blanket the community. Um, definitely church. That is certainly a center of communication in my community as well. Ah, community groups like WhatsApp or group messaging services. Um, we've got, a, I think it's called Nextdoor. I can't even remember what the program is, but um, a, a basically listserv for our, not our tiny neighborhood, but um, our extended neighborhood. The school board can help you get information out. Email list serves, radio, community events, email blasts, parent groups. You know, I love that um, networking. Lauren is uh, using Nextdoor, and I think that means that I remembered the, the service right. Um, and a number of people are reinforcing that Nextdoor is a great way. Ads in the newspaper or local town bulletins. You know, my um, my big city newspaper, because I live in the Washington area, is the Washington Post. And you have to be independently wealthy to take out an ad. But as I mentioned, we have a free community newspaper, and it is very inexpensive to um, put an ad in that newspaper. And sometimes if they consider the issue that we're working on to be a local community service, they will let us put information in the paper for free. Um, attending collaborative meetings with a variety of other organizations. So identifying organizations that might care about things that you care about and asking if you can have five minutes on the agenda to present to their members. And boy, has that gotten easier with Zoom, hasn't it? Um, Patch.com, the homeowners association, if you have one, community policing groups. And, um, and you know, it is interesting how word of mouth can spread through community policing groups. And actually, um, our police precinct is helpful in spreading information as well. Um, Monica says in her town, word of mouth and the local Facebook page is the most helpful. Um, and uh, Facebook for sure. And uh, Michael says that people get to set up booths at the farmer's market and canvas the, the weekend crowd there, which is a great local grassroots way. Super. So, you know, especially this week with the elections last week, we can hardly have a conversation about influencing uh, elected officials without talking about elections. So let's go to the next slide and take a moment to do that. So what about elections? Um, a lot of people figure that their vote, like their meetings, doesn't matter. Um, and as much as we can doubt whether the emails and the phone calls and the meetings, the conversations make a difference. When you think about how many people are voting, it can be very easy to convince yourself that votes don't matter. We kind of, you know, our, our schoolhouse rock knee jerk idea is that in a democracy, the main way that you express your opinions is through voting. And then contradictory uh, or counterintuitively, we also kind of assume, do votes make a difference anyway? So this election that we had last week um, is going to go down in the history books as a, a real case study in how every vote matters and every vote counts. 
Um, I think that we still have six or seven congressional seats that are too close to call. I haven't checked that number lately. A couple of days ago, it was 20 seats. I think we're down to about six. Um, those congressional seats are going to be decided by a fairly small number of votes, and um, they're going to be deciding control of the House of Representatives. You know, to use a Virginia example, because I live in Virginia, we went through that in 2017. And this also has become a poster child in the stories for why every vote matters. So in 2017, control of the House of Delegates in the Virginia State Legislature was kind of up for grabs. Um, the, the number had settled at 51 Republicans and 49 Democrats. Um, sorry, the, the number had settled at 50 Democrats and 50 Republicans. And one seat was decided by 10 votes. Because the margin was so narrow, the candidate who was determined to have lost asked for a recount. And in the recount, the winner flipped to the other candidate who was up by one single vote. That one single vote gave the election for that seat to the Republican candidate. And that one single vote and one single Republican seat gave control of the state house to Republicans for the next two years. So um, there are certainly cases where every single vote matters. Um, sometimes it's not one vote as we had in the Virginia case. You know, in 2004, the Washington governor's race was decided by 133 votes out of more than 1.3 million votes cast. Voting makes a difference. Not in every single election can we say that one vote or two votes made a difference, but in a surprising number of, um, of elections, a very small number of votes can change things. You know, in the um, election between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton for president, if 30,000 votes total nationwide in a few key districts had gone the other way, Hillary Clinton would have been elected president. Surprising numbers of votes, surprisingly few numbers of votes can make a big difference. But elections aren't just about voting. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to get ready for elections and in order to persuade people to turn out to vote and also to vote for a particular candidate. We talked on a prior webinar about contributions and can you influence elected officials by making campaign contributions? I argued that the main um, opportunity that is created by giving a campaign contribution is time with the elected official to make your case. And there are other ways to uh, get time with that elected official and to make your case. I will also argue that in the context of elections, there are ways to influence, to be a part of the team and to influence the outcome of elections without making contributions. Why is it that elected officials are looking for campaign contributions? Well, it's because in order to win elections, they have to pay for things to get their word, their word out. They need to pay staff to knock on doors. They need to pay staff um, to um, help get voters to the polls. Um, they need to pay for mailers that they send to voters. They need to pay staff to help organize debates and community events. 
So if you are in a position to volunteer and help with all of those things, you don't need to give money. You can help the candidate that you believe in um, accomplish those things without or with fewer campaign contributions. And elections can be a wonderful way for you to help advocate within your community and to advocate for the issue that you particularly care about. I will say um, knocking on doors and making telephone calls during election season is not my personal favorite thing to do because increasingly I find that um, people, strangers, when you knock on doors in the context of an election, they're less friendly than they used to be. And sometimes they can be downright rude, which makes me a little uncomfortable. But the vast majority of people, when I've done door knocking or when I've made phone calls, they're interested in talking about the issues. They want to know why you are supporting the candidate that you support. And it's an opportunity, if the reason you're um, campaigning for this particular candidate is because of their position on education, it's an opportunity to educate voters about education needs as well as the candidate's position. If you are um, campaigning for that candidate because or volunteering for that candidate because of their position on health care, it's a great opportunity to educate people about health care needs in their community that they may not be aware of. So when we think about elections, think about it as far more than voting. It is an opportunity uh, to educate the voters on issues that you care a lot about. And it's also an opportunity to build connections with a candidate so that when they become the elected official, or if they continue as the elected official, um, you can use those connections to promote the issues you care about. So the most important message from all three of these webinars is to remember that you can do this. Don't be intimidated by elected officials. You are the expert on the issues that are going on in your community. And elected officials need your help. They need the information that you have about what is happening, what the problems are, and what the potential solutions are. You don't have to have all of the answers. You don't have to have all of the details, but you have critically important information about what's going on in your community that your elected officials need in order to do their job. They're people just like you. They might have a different life experience. They might have a different level of education or income, but at the end of the day, they care about the community and they want to try to solve problems. So our final slide here is a reminder. You are the expert and you can do this. Thank you so much for all that you do to advocate for children and families in your community. Have a good afternoon.